What's going on, everybody? It has been a very, very long time since I have done a solo show recorded and not broadcast live. But I think this is the type of topic that lends itself a little bit better to a recorded show. So what I'm doing today is taking a look at my process from start to finish of building out my NFL lines. Um, I'm going to focus on FanDuel today, but the process is essentially the same not really making any changes. It just so happens that I'm going to be playing predominantly on FanDuel this week. So DraftKings people, don't freak out. Uh, most of this, if not all of this, is still applicable. But I just want to walk through it all because we get questions like this all the time and I've wanted to do content like this all the time. Simply haven't had time and we're working our way to that now that baseball is over and we're slowly getting into the NBA I think a little dedicated show to what I'm doing on a week to week basis for the NFL would be valuable. I think people will like that. So this is my start. Uh, I'll be playing 300 unique lines this week. I know I'm saying lines, So if that's tilting anybody, my apologies. Uh, I'm going to walk through everything that I've ha I have in my Excel workbook and the way that I get around here. Uh, we're going to do a walkthrough of all my settings on fantasy cruncher. So if that's something you're interested in, check that out. And then uh, we'll see the results of the crunch. We'll bring that back into this sheet and uh, we'll make some adjustments. I, we're not, this isn't going to be the end of it all. Obviously, this is only, um, you're seeing this Friday morning. Uh, I won't finalize any of this until the live stream from noon to one o'clock on Sunday with Chris. So this is how we're starting it off. Uh, I normally don't take a look at anything in the NFL until our ownership drops or previously uh until any ownership drops i got cords all over me here um so our ownership projections came out earlier today and now i'm ready to record this and talk to you guys so let's start it off uh first thing i do i load in uh projection sources i use a blend of a couple sources including uh what we have at osimo uh, i weight them differently uh depending on the site depending on um uh position i'll adjust slightly depending on which site i'm getting uh just because i like some sites a little bit more than others for uh certain positions we don't really have to get into this blend this works for whatever anybody is trying to do but for now um i just wanted to let you guys know that i use a blend for projections now i do have our ownership projections in already and the first thing that i usually like to take a do take a look at is where the public is going to be and you can see here uh, in this table that i'm selecting right now um the two highest projected ownership games on the slate are saints and giants and bengals and falcons now again this is friday we have two full days before the season or before the week starts so don't need to get too crazy over these numbers that's why i don't mind showing them right now but I want to know where the chalk's going to be just out of the gate and whether or not I think that I'm going to line up with that chalk. So we're seeing Saints and Giants uh, quite a bit to Barkley, quite a bit to Kamara, surprise, surprise, quite a bit to Michael Thomas and Beckham, again, surprise, surprise. It seems like a pretty natural game to be stacking. Oh, there's a fly in here. Get out of here, fly. It's like a Breaking Bad episode. Perfect, perfect quality for right now on a recorded thing. Like, I'm going to start over. Come on now. So other than Saints and Giants, uh, similar ownership. And by similar, I mean the exact same. Bengals and Falcons. Lots of ownership to Dalton Bernard, A.J. Green, Tyler Eifert. Um, lots of ownership to Tevin Coleman and Julio Jones. Makes perfect sense to me. Um, I like to use this game ownership sort of as a proxy for what I want to do for the day, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'll disregard um, high owned teams. But my first step after taking a look at that is checking out the quarterbacks in these particular matchups. I would like them to be some of my higher valued quarterbacks and the gap is really tight outside of the you know, the CJ Beathards of the world. Uh, most of these guys are in a similar range, but I still prefer to focus on the most value I can get at quarterback. And I hope that that corresponds with some ownership advent advantages. So for Saints and Giants, uh, Drew Brees, most expensive quarterback, 
uh, let me pause here. So um, this isn't going to be a show about like picks or like, oh, I can't believe you're on Drew Brees. I can't believe you're not on Andrew Luck, whatever, the, whatever the sentence is going to be. This is more holistically about the quote unquote process of what I'm doing. So don't get too hung up on the specific guys. Um, this is all very subject to change and will look different by Sunday, but this is how I do it. So first guy I would be looking at because this is the chalk game is Breeze and then Eli Manning. And right away I can see just based on this color scheme in this in, in column D, uh, Drew Brees, most expensive guy on the slate. He's getting a little bit of ownership. Um, he's the third most projected owned quarterback on FanDuel. And he doesn't really have the best value grade. He's not a guy that I am going to be focusing on all that much. And I, sim I have a similar feeling about Eli Manning. Now, I don't have a big issue with having Barkley if I get him, Beckham if I get him, Kamara, Michael Thomas. Because I think the situation is good, but I'm not going to go to all that much Drew Brees or Eli Manning right now. Um, if these numbers change a little bit, if Breeze falls slightly, I can see having a little bit of Breeze. I don't really have much interest in Eli Manning, although the 3% ownership is a little bit appealing. You know, I'd much rather have Eli Manning than, say, Baker Mayfield uh, if he's going to be twice his owned. But for now, I'm not going to be really paying attention much to those games. And I have a similar stance for Cincinnati and Atlanta. Matt Ryan, um, not getting as much ownership as I would have expected, but 8,100 is a pretty healthy price point for him. Uh, he has one of the worst values in my projections on a dollar for dollar basis. So he's a guy that I'm not paying all that much attention to. Um, and then similar story for Andy Dalton. Dalton's second most chalky quarterback of the day. And that just jumps out at me right away. If his value number was quite a bit higher if he were the first or second best value in my stuff i'd i'd look to him a little bit more but because he's supposed to be chalky he's not grading out all that well for me uh, i'm more likely to just use some of his weapons than use dalton himself i like to play a relatively is much different for me for baseball or than baseball or even basketball i like to use a relatively tight core at quarterback and I'll expound on that a little bit here. So I do have a sim set up using uh, my projected scoring for each quarterback. Um, I have a formula that you know, spits out a generic standard deviation because I don't think it's all that important. I just want to see, um, practically speaking, how everybody fits. And what I'm doing is calculating the chance that a quarterback is one of the top four scoring quarterbacks of the day. And you'll see that it's a relatively tight spread. Uh, Aaron Rodgers is at the top for this week at 29%, only 4% expected ownership. So a lot of what I'm doing is is trying to leverage guys that I think could be high scoring quarterbacks with ownership. So right now I'm looking at Aaron Rodgers. I'm looking at Tom Brady. I'm not looking at Breeze or Ryan for right now. They could trickle into some lines later, but that's not what I'm doing. Uh, I'm looking quite a bit at Phillip Rivers. Deshaun Watson is an interesting one. He's a guy that I'm absolutely targeting. Even though he is 13% owned or projected to be 13% owned and going to be the chop quarterback of the slate. Uh, he's also this, he has the second highest opportunity to be a top four scoring quarterback. So I'm not going to disregard Watson the same way that I would disregard, say, Andy Dalton, who has a significantly less chance of being a top four scoring quarterback, but similar ownership. So right now I'm looking at Brady, Rodgers, Rivers, Watson, Russell Wilson, Ryan, Fit Ryan Fitzpatrick. And you'll see Ryan Fitzpatrick dropped uh, under 20 here, but only 2% expected ownership. Uh, I like the leverage there. And then Ryan Tannehill will be the guy that I'll be paying down for. Is getting a little popular. He had a big week last week. I was on him last week. Um, but again, Tannehill projecting... Uh, up in the 20s with relatively low ownership. So that's seven guys right now that I have. That's how I'm going to move forward for this exercise. That could end up being eight or nine by the time we get to Sunday. Don't worry about that too much, but that's where I'm at right now. Uh, by controlling my quarterback pool, it sort of controls the rest of what my lines are going to look like.
So that's how I land on everything. I go through ownership to see if I want to be anywhere near those guys. And then I check out individual quarterbacks. It's the only spot that I pay attention to before I run a crunch. After I run a crunch, I'll go through each possession or position and you'll I'll do this on the video. I'll go through each position and compare my ownership to what we're projecting to make sure nothing stands out as really ridiculous guys that are projecting 1% owned and I get like 25, I can safely knock that back because I don't need that sort of leverage. So that's what I'm doing right now. You'll see that most of my player pool corresponds to the guys that are popping up in bright green uh, in this column. This is the same sort of metric that I use in baseball where I'm taking the fantasy points to the square root of three, dividing that by salary, multiplying that by 100. I just like giving extra weight to guys that score more relative to the dollar uh, because you only have so many spots. Think of it as a lineup construction issue. Um, you'd see that like I could go to Prescott, Trubisky, Bortles. If I'm going to go down really far, I don't want to go much further than Tannehill. I don't need a bunch of these guys. There's not really any ownership on them either, so I'll take my chances. Brings us to Fantasy Cruncher. Um, this is a tool that pretty much runs everything that I do. If it wasn't for Fantasy Cruncher, I probably wouldn't be in this video right now. Uh, it allows me to do everything I'm trying to do. So I've already, as you can see, unselected every quarterback except for the guys that I talked about. And I have run a crunch on this previous, but let's delete that so that we don't have to worry about any of those percentages. Um, for right now, I have my maximum exposure on a quarterback set at 25%. I have running backs, wide receivers both set at 40. I have tight ends set at 30. And I have defenses set at 12. I generally don't want to have a one defense a lot. I like to spread that out quite a bit. Um, I run 5% randomness on every single position just so I get a little bit of extra wiggle room. 5% is not going to be much. Um, but I do, so like if you have somebody projected for 20, uh, you'd be looking at basically 19 to 21 points in uh, on each individual lineup crunch. Uh, that gives me enough so that if I have two guys that are relatively close in value, it's not just always going to be the same guy. I like to have a little bit of balance there. So 5% randomness, just enough to get guys to wiggle around. Those are my percentages. I play with them, and I will adjust individually after I do my first crunch and subsequent crunches after this. Uh, but that's just where I like to start. I don't ever really want to have anybody more than that. Um, I've already filtered out you know, games for just the main slate. Uh, so this would be my thought process on any relatively large NFL slate, 10 games or higher. Um, we'll save everything else for another show. So you can see right now the settings that I have up. These are the settings that I use. Uh, two uniques per lineup. I like to get one running back unique. This is a new setting. Um, and then I like to do two unique wide receivers per position. So uh, this really gives me an excellent balance, uh, swaps people out in the right spot. So I don't have, you know, a lot of the same lineup, but it is a lot of the same core. I don't necessarily put a minimum team salary in, but I will give it an eyeball just to make sure I'm not leaving too much salary on the table. And I uncheck the tight end flex position, particularly here where... I just generally don't like to run a two tight end set. There are situations where I would want to put individual guys in there. And for this example, I'm going to leave it checked to see what shows up. There are only a certain amount of guys that I would want to use in that second spot, like to run a two tight end on FanDuel. Um, you're going to be significantly more impacted by the touchdown. So I like it a little bit more on FanDuel than DK. But for the most part, if I'm running two tight ends, I'm going to want them to either be an incredible value play for that particular day or guys that are at the top of the heap, the Gronks and Kelsies and Ertz of the world. So that's how I run my settings to start. Uh, I won't include anybody under three points, which I think is a relatively reasonable spot. Um, I'm going to bounce over to position stacks now, and I have three things set. 
Uh, the first stack rule that I have is that I will never have my defense with my quarterback. Um, generally speaking, if I'm going to get a def- you're looking to get a defense that scores, um, or at least hopefully you're going to get a defense that scores. And if your defense is scoring, I more often than not, your quarterback is going to be a little bit limited. Um, so I just try to make sure that that doesn't happen. You could catch cases where that's a problem, but for me, I just don't want that. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of that correlation. Uh, the next rule that I have on here is new for fantasy cruncher, but I think it's really great. Um, what I like to do is limit the amount of quarterback running back or tight ends that I can have in a particular lineup from the same team to one, unless that group is paired with the quarterback. So if you're going to end up, if you don't have that limit on and you run a crunch and you get, I don't know, Melvin Gordon and Keenan Allen in a lineup, but you don't have Phillip Rivers in the, in the crunch, it's not really a great lineup because you, you're getting the benefit of those guys without, if those guys both go off, there's a decent chance that Rivers is having a big day too. So if I'm going to have more than one guy in a lineup, the only way that's going to happen is if they're paired with a quarterback. And then finally, my third stacking rule uh, is the the bring back philosophy. So anytime that I have a quarterback, I'm going to have at least one wide receiver or tight end from the other team. Think of it like a game stack. If things are going really well for your quarterback and a couple wide receivers, the thought process is that the other team is going to be throwing to keep up and you want to try to catch one of those guys to catch a touchdown. Pretty simple. Pretty standard, I think, for uh, a lot of the industry as well. If you would go back using any of the tools that, or you just even, you know, go back through um, contest files on DK, you can go back and check to see, you know, how some of the pros are doing it. This is what I run out. Uh, I don't do anything on the team stacks tab. The my data tab, not really essential for me right now. The key thing we have here are groups. And this is basically the linchpin of everything that I'm doing for the NFL. If you're not setting groups, I'm not even really sure how you're multi-entering anything. So what I've done now is set up seven groups. Those seven groups correspond to the seven quarterbacks that I mentioned earlier. They all have the quarterback set as the key player in the group. So if you go to create new group, you would type in a quarterback's name. Let's say Drew Brees. Drew Brees would come up. You would click the key, and that moves him to the key player. So what this says is if the key player is used, the following rule is applied. This allows you to do your game stacks. Um, by using him as, since I'll only have those quarterbacks, every time one of those quarterbacks pop up, this rule is going to be relevant. So for an example, I have the Patriots up here. Brady is the key player for the Patriots. If Tom Brady is used, I want to use at least two people from the group of Gronk, James White, Chris Hogan, Philip Dorsett, Josh Gordon. Um, this could change. It could clearly not have Josh Gordon. It might have Josh Gordon. Um, there's wiggle room on who's going to be there, but essentially I want guys that are either going to be getting targets out of the backfield or targets receiving, whether that's a wide receiver or a tight end. I have similar groups set up for Green Bay that will be using two of these four guys, uh, two for the Chargers, lots of options there. Uh, only one from the Texans because Watson is uh, pretty adept on his feet. I only want either Hopkins or Fuller. I don't want anybody else on the team, at least not as of right now, depending on my ownership. Now, the, one thing to keep in mind, this does say at least one that will not stop you from getting Hopkins and Fuller. Now, their prices may, but this won't stop you. You could still get them both. Seattle, I'm using Russell Wilson and these guys. Tampa Bay, using Fitzpatrick and at least two of these guys. Fitzpatrick almost assuredly is going to be getting this through the air. So I want to make sure that if Fitzpatrick has another big uh, Fitzmagic game, I get two of the receivers. And then finally, Tannehill is going to be one from this group. So this sets up all my groups. I load these up as early as I can. I'll have similar groups on both FanDuel and DraftKings, but this is what's going to make my crunches work. So that's all the settings that I've got so far. Those are the groups that I've got so far. They may be there on Sunday. They may not. We'll see. 
Uh, we could even talk about it during the Sunday live stream. I didn't even realize that my stupid dome piece is hanging over part of this, but I think we'll be okay. Yeah, we're fine. So now I'm ready to run a crunch. Um, I'm going to run 150 lines just to start, and then I'm going to pop over the results of this crunch into this spreadsheet, and then we can take a look and see sort of where we end up. So running 150 now, I wanted you guys to see it. And you'll see that on the quarterback sheet, I've got six of the seven. But as of right now, I'm not getting one of these guys. I'm not getting any Fitz magic. Well, now I did. It just popped up for a small amount. It's something that I'll deal with later because there's a decent chance that I don't end up with 25% of Russell Wilson. But we'll cross that bridge when we, when we get to it. And this will allow me to see all of my ownership directly next to the expected ownership. But more importantly, it, it'll show me how much over the field I am on a particular game. I'd be very surprised if I'm over the field on Saints, Giants, or Cincy, Atlanta, because I'm not going to the quarterbacks. But games like Miami, New England, where I have Tannehill and Brady in the player pool, I'm expecting to be well over the field. Um, what would be another game? I think that I could be over on Houston Indy just because of the way that game shakes out. Uh, if I'm stacking up Houston with Deshaun Watson, I'm expecting to see probably a pretty solid amount of T.Y. Hilton. Uh, similarly for Tampa Bay, I think it'll be pretty easy to stack Fitzmagic. Obviously, the Bears defense, a little scary. This is more of a play against ownership than anything else, but I think that I'll see quite a bit of Allen Robinson. Um, and then for Green Bay, this is the one I'm not really excited about. I'm interested to see who comes through as the value on the way back for a Green Bay stack. My guess is that it'll be predominantly Charles Clay, but we'll see when we dump this crunch in right now. Almost there, 125 lines. For Seattle, I fully expect Larry Fitzgerald to be one of my more popular plays. But again, we'll cross that once we come to it. Oh, it's going to be a fun week four, guys. And a lot of what's happening in this process can be taken from NFL and applied to other sports. While groups might not be as essential in, say, baseball, you're going to be looking more at team stacks. Uh, I think groups are very, very valuable in the NBA. Um, if you heard myself and Lafayette today, uh, in our what was supposed to be an NFL discussion and what turned into a discussion about Carmelo Anthony. Um, setting up groups for guys that like have high assist rates for other guys. So Lafayette's example was James Harden and Clint Capella. Uh, like 50 plus percent of Capella's field goals were assisted by James Harden. You can set up a group that says like anytime that I use Clint Capella in a lineup, you also want to bring James Harden with you. Uh, that can create some naturally positive correlations in your lines. Seven, eight lines left. I, fe I felt like I could have said seven and it would have popped in there first, but it didn't. As you can see, we're getting a lot of Ryan Tannehill, which should come as very little surprise because he was grading out as the best value. Um, that will get... I will nerf that. There are limits to how much I'll want to be over the field on anybody. For, but for the first draft, I want to get everybody at their raw number because I don't like making too many changes. I generally think that the optimizer is pretty good at its job and I don't want to try to outthink it too much. But sometimes it just desperately needs to be thought about. Uh, there's just simply too many options that look bad after you're done. So like right here, uh, Doyle and Jordan Howard, you can see the double tight end. That's a situation where I would probably leave it actually, you know, assuming Doyle plays, let's, let's not worry about that too much right now. Um, but I would probably leave Doyle and Jordan Howard. I think that's a decent spot for Jordan Howard to potentially score a touchdown. And I'll be, I'll be perfectly fine with that. It allows me to do bigger things through that lineup. Um, you know, getting Zeke, Will Fuller, a Deshaun Watson stack, Jarvis Landry. These are all guys that are relatively expensive. Anyway, crunch is done. 
So I'm gonna dump this back out into my folder, refresh my crunch, and then we'll take a look and see where we end up. It's a FanDuel crunch. Save it as FanDuel crunch. Let's refresh the table. Pow, yeah. And I'll take a look at it. So right away when I see it, um, you can see that I'm significantly over the field on Miami compared to New uh, Miami and New England compared to the field. I'm happy with that. Uh, I'm a bit under the field on Saints and Giants and Cincy and Atlanta because I'm not using their quarterbacks. It makes perfect sense to me. Uh, but I do still have quite a bit of ownership. And as you'll see, a lot of it going to Barkley, Beckham, Kamara, Michael Thomas. We'll worry about those specifics later. Um, massively under the field on Cleveland, Oakland. Uh, neither game had a quarterback stack in it. So the best that I'm going to be able to do is get one offs from the game. I'm happy there over the field on Houston, over the field on San Francisco and the chargers. Basically what you're going to see is games where I have a quarterback. I'll be over the field games where I don't, I'll probably end up under it. That's fine. You got to be somewhere. Uh, so the first thing that I would do when I come over here to look at my quarterback exposures, I would know right off the bat, I don't want to have 25% Ryan Tannehill. That's a terrifying proposition. If we're projecting 6% ownership, I would probably cap Ryan Tannehill at 18. I think being three times the field on Tannehill would be the spot that I would want to be. So I'm just going to go to Miami in, um, in my sheet. I'm going to switch Tannehill's ownership to 18%. And I'll hop back over here, look at it again. I feel pretty similar to Russell Wilson. I don't want to have 23% Russell Wilson, so I will hop back over here, go to Seattle, find Russell Wilson, and 18% for Russell Wilson. Now, we might not even end up there, but I just can't have that much above the field. I'm fine with being over the field on Deshaun Watson. I would like to have more Brady and Rodgers, and I think what I will do is probably give a thumbs up to Brady since he has a slightly lesser value rating. Uh, and probably to Rodgers, and that will balance everybody out. Fine with Rivers' exposure. I'd like to get a little bit more Fitz Magic to probably switch his ownership to something like six, and then give him a thumbs up to make sure that I get to it. That's what I would handle for all of the quarterbacks. Um, let's actually do that right now. I'm going to hop over, give Fitz... A little bit of a lock. So let's lock him in at 5% and then I will give him the old thumbs up over here. Let's thumbs up Brady and Rogers and Fitzpatrick. And then we'll see what the balance is in the ownership uh, once we do a recrunch. But more importantly than that, we need to take a look at the rest of the positions. This is key. And this is where I learned a valuable lesson last week of being lazy and not going back to check things where Matt Ryan was my highest exposed quarterback. And I've talked about this on streams. Um, I knew that I had some Calvin Ridley in lines before my final crunch. I wasn't paying too much attention, but when you know that you have a guy like Watson or Wilson, Wilson in particular in this example, you want to make sure that you've got at least one lineup with all of his potential pass catchers. Um, I did a final crunch during the live stream, still had my heavy exposure to Matt Ryan, uh, but when I made my adjustments to Gio Bernard and Latavius Murray, it actually pulled all of my Calvin Ridley lines up, lineups on both DraftKings and FanDuel. And I never went back to check it. And you guys know how Calvin Ridley did if you're watching this video. Always make sure that if you're going to have a highly exposed quarterback, they're at least double checking to see what the spread on his additional receivers are going to be. If you're going to have 25% Ryan Tannehill, make sure that at least one of every, like, at least one of all the guys that are in your groups for those people are in at least one lineup. Just, you don't want to miss like that. So the first thing that I'm going to do then is head over to my running back projections and exposures. I hope everyone can see that. I think I zoomed in a little too far. Let's bump this down. And there's going to be a couple things that stand out here, like a very sore thumb. First and foremost, we're projecting Sony Michel to 21% ownership, and I've got three, and I am relatively comfortable with that. I'd like to have a little bit more, and as I adjust other people's ownership, he's a guy that's going to push up, but 21% is a lot. I don't need to chase it. But the main one that I would want to look at right now, and this is a lot to do with his status for the game, but 
We're projecting Leonard Fournette at 3% ownership, and I've got 19. That is more than I would like to have. I'm not going to do the 3% because I'd be okay having a little bit more than 10. So what I'm going to do is bump Leonard Fournette's exposure to 12%. And again, this is a constant give and take. You're never going to get it perfect, but I just want to make sure that I always get close. So ignore his health for right now. I'm just going to drop that to 12 Jordan Howard, similarly, uh, God, I went through that Jack Doyle, Jordan Howard thing before thinking that it was reading as Trey Burton. <sighs> well, if you were listening to that portion and you got to this, realize that I caught my mistake and I'm a moron. Um, it's late 1028 Eastern time right now. And, uh, I've been watching a lot of shows and my mind's melting a little bit. Um, I don't want to have 23% Jordan Howard if he is. 6% projected ownership. I think that probably 15 on Howard is where I want to be. I just don't want to have too many of the same lineups with Jordan Howard in it. He is not good enough for me to um, to warrant being that far over the field. Other than that, I don't see any that really stand out all that much. I'm a little nervous about the Kamara chalk, but at the same time, uh, he projects really well, so it's it's really hard to ignore it. It's probably not going to go anywhere either. I would also like to take a look at wide receiver. And this is going to be a similar scenario. Compare it to exposures or expected ownership. Make sure that I don't have anything that's wildly inappropriate. And then I can head to tight ends. And tight end is going to be the one that has quite a bit of ridiculousness. And it's going to be the key reason you want to go through this. I don't see anybody here that is making that is giving me pause. It is a big time spread of all of the wide receivers and I'm very happy about that. This one's going to look weird. Ready? Boom. Gronk at 30%, totally cool with it. But I'm getting 21% Jack Doyle and 20% Nick Vanette. That is absolutely not happening if these guys are both projected at 0 or 1%. Now Doyle's health is a question mark, but even still, I don't want to be there that much on either guy. And this is more about the exercise than anything else. So first I'm going to hop over to Indy and nerf Jack Doyle's ownership, pull him down to 10%. Um, I think that's perfectly fine. Similar story for Nick Vanette for Seattle. Um, just impossible for me to want to have that much of him. If he's only 1%, I only want eight. This is tight end after all. I don't want to go too crazy. Um, perfectly fine having 30% Gronk. Uh, I'm actually not too upset with having 12% George Kittle, but he is a guy that I do want to adjust a little bit. Now that I'm pulling the ownership from Doyle and from, from, from Vanette, I could see Kittle's ownership going up. So what I am going to do is cap George Kittle as well at 10%. And that'll basically cover me. That's just step one of what I would need to do. I'll come over here. I'll find Kittle somewhere. Change that to 10%. And then I'm going to go up and grab all of my projections and my uh, my new ownership caps again. And I'm going to drop them into Fantasy Cruncher and I'm going to crunch another 150. And once I get to the point where I think the balance is nice, that's where I'll let another 150 rip and I will put those 300 in the, three tor or in the two tournaments that I'm entering. So uploading the new projections, you'll see that I switched to just my pool for the quarterbacks. Um, Russell Wilson down to 18. Tannehill down to 18. Fitzpatrick at five with the thumbs up. Brady and Rodgers both similarly thumbs up. Um, I'll take a look at it once I hit crunch just to make sure that the thumbs up aren't overly affecting anyone. Um, like I still didn't get to uh, any fits right out of the gate, but I am getting more Rodgers and more Brady, and that makes me happy. Looks like I'm probably going to need a second thumbs up to Fitzpatrick to push him through. So what I am going to do is hit stop. Just because I could see it happening, I'm going to give him the second thumbs up, force him in a little bit more. Since I set his ownership cap at 5%, it's not going to go too crazy. But that should allow me to get up to that 5% mark for Fitzpatrick. And now I'm getting the balance of additional Brady, additional Rodgers. I'm getting everybody where I want them to be, and that makes me quite happy. Once I drop this second one in after the adjustments, uh, that'll be the time where I'll take a look at the team stacks again and make sure that 
for example, let's use let's use Russell Wilson for Seattle since I had a ton of him. So I've got Russell Wilson here. I have some Chris Carson, some Tyler Lockett, a little bit of Brandon Marshall, but I didn't get any Doug Baldwin, which kind of surprises me, but not really just because his projections are kind of weird right now. But by dropping um, that 20 down to eight, I should be able to get a little bit of wiggle room here and make sure that I'm covering all my bases. Similarly for say, let's look at Phillip Rivers. Did I get everybody? So I got Melvin Gordon, obviously. I got Keenan Allen, obviously. A couple shares of Austin Eckler, a couple shares of uh, Tyrell Williams and Travis Benjamin. I did not, however, get any Mike Williams. So before I would go to lock, if I didn't get any Mike Williams on this upcoming crunch, what I would do would be I would go set his ownership to 1% in Fantasy Cruncher. I would give him the triple thumbs up, and then I would run it again to make sure that I forced in, at the minimum, one lineup with Mike Williams. And I'd probably end up getting two or three since I'm running 300 lines, 1% of 300, clearly three. But you really, I can't stress enough how bad you need to go back and make sure your exposures on a team by team basis make sense. Otherwise, you leave a 40 point Stephen, or, uh, Calvin Ridley line on the table. I wonder now how many times I've said Stephen Ridley instead of Calvin Ridley because I'm terrible with names. I also wonder if I've said Russell Westbrook instead of Russell Wilson because if anybody's been following me since the NBA season, um, I would call Russell Westbrook Russell Wilson over and over and over again for months. I don't know what it is. It's the RW. You just can't get it. So if I called Calvin Ridley, Stephen Ridley earlier, uh, chalk that up for the second time where uh, Josh talking to himself goes incorrect. 150 lines. We are crunched. Let's dump this in, take one last look, and then uh, we'll get out of here. We're already at 37 minutes. I think this is a pretty good length right now. So crunch. I think I saved it, but honestly, mentally, not right there. Let's save it again and refresh. Fantasy Cruncher on FanDuel, kaboom. And we head back for the review. Now this looks a lot better to me just right off the bat. I've got more Tom Brady, close to three times the field, awesome. Got more Aaron Rodgers, double the field, awesome. I love the Rivers exposure. I'm happy to be over the field on Watson, or at least I don't, I don't mind necessarily. Happy to be here on Russell Wilson. I'm over the field on Fitzpatrick, and I've got trip the field on Tannehill. Everybody that I've set my mark on, I'm above the field. Makes me happy. Still coming in under the field on Giants and Cincy. Still way over on Miami. This distribution isn't changing all that much. What we really want to do is take a look at the rest of the positions. So running back, still going to look pretty similar. Smashing a lot of the top. I've brought down Fournette. I've got a ton of Geo Bernard, and I'm perfectly fine with that. I think he's a really good value at 6,400. I do want to pay attention, if we're talking about this from like a picks perspective, I do want to pay attention to him. Uh, if he is still one of just two running backs in the backfield for the Bengals, uh, he's a guy that I'm going to want. There's just too much opportunity. I like the amount of James White I'm getting there. If I'm going to have that much Brady, I'm perfectly fine not having that much Sony Michelle. I don't really trust the Pats running game. This could go to anybody um, but that would be something I would pay closer attention to as we get closer to lock. Um, getting a little bit of Deion Lewis as a value guy, but you see, like, I'm not picking up randoms. I'm mostly f focusing on the guys that are going to get uh, a pretty steady amount of carries. And on FanDuel, I think that's relevant because of the half point PPR uh, makes the running game a little bit more important. On wide receiver, because I had that set to two uniques, you'll see it quite a bit more of a spread here. And obviously, there's going to be more wide receivers, so you get that as well. But um, I want to take my chances here. You're trying to catch, you know, you want to get multi touchdown games from wideouts since it's only a half point PPR. So I'm going to be under on Michael Thomas, under on Julio Jones. Um, I feel like I'm probably spread a little too thin here, but we're not seeing any crazy ownership. Nobody over 20%. Um, so I'm relatively happy with the distribution that I'm getting here. I think what I might do, and it's up in the air. Um, I want to see what the results would look like if I switched from one unique wide receiver. So in the advanced options, 
instead of having this set to two, I do want to take a look and see what setting that to one will look like in terms of my distribution. Uh, but for right now, I'm pretty comfortable with what I'm seeing. I don't mind being relatively close to the field on most of these guys. Um, I love Hopkins clearly. And if I'm going to have that much Deshaun, I'm going to want that much Hopkins, but like AJ green, you know, you can't play everybody. So if I'm avoiding Cincy Atlanta in any sort of bulk, I'm naturally going to be avoiding as much AJ green. And I'm cool with that. Um, it is a great spot. Uh, don't get me wrong, but again, we're not worried about picks here right now. We're more, we're more, more worried about the process behind it all. God, I felt like my, uh, my record started playing in reverse. I like being over the field on Will Fuller. Nothing here standing out as something that I want to like freak out about. Tight end's the one where things get squirrely. Got a ton of Gronk, ton of Ertz. I like having that much Kittle. Get some Jared Cook. I'm totally cool with that. Still got my Jack Doyle. I'm avoiding the 14% uh, Chalky Tyler Eifert. Now that one makes me a little nervous because he's such a great value. But man, I just can't trust him. So I'm cool with it. I like my exposures that I'm getting right now. I couldn't be happier with the way that it's popping out. You know, defense is going to be all over the map. Fine with it. Uh, I don't, I can't pay too much attention to it. You can overthink it and be like, oh, I want to get some of that Vikings defense in there. And uh, then they play the bills. So to just close this out now, uh, let's just go take a look at rivers. Clearly I'm getting Gordon at double the field. I love him. He's one of the best plays of the day, in my opinion. Uh, still getting my Keenan Allen, but I'm getting a little bit of everybody. I'm getting Eckler, Mike Williams, Tyrell Williams, Travis Benjamin, so that if something goes crazy, and if we hop back over here and look at the Rivers lineups, you know, I'm getting Allen Gordon, Allen Gordon, Allen Gordon, Allen Benjamin, Allen Gordon. Let's try to find some more of the unique ones. Eckler Allen. Tyrell Williams and Gordon, Tyrell Williams and Keenan Allen. Like I'm getting a bunch of the combinations. I'm going to get more Gordon and Keenan Allen than anybody because they're the two best plays on the day for them. But I am still sprinkling in other guys, Austin Eckler, Tyrell Williams. Like that's the type of line where you can get really fun with it. And then you'll see that we've got Kittle coming back. Totally cool with it. Uh, you know, Eckler makes me nervous. Clearly uh, not a ton of targets last week. I mean, not a ton of targets in general. I probably shouldn't have a uh, 5% Austin Eckler, but if you're a believer in the Chargers, you kind of got to be a believer there. You just got to hope for the best. You're trying to get, get a touchdown in some of this stuff. That's just another thing that we could look at uh, if we want to look at someone like Aaron Rodgers. You know, we're making sure that we get... And this is what I was talking about. I didn't know who was going to come back on the other side for the Bills, but, you know, Adams and Cobb, Ad Cobb and Allison, Adams and Allison... Unique combinations of all Cobb and Graham. You get unique combinations of these guys. Um, getting Kelvin Benjamin, Charles Clay, Zay Jones. You know, it makes me a little bit nervous to to bring someone back on the Bills, and it's something that I'll look into a little bit more. But you know, maybe Josh Allen's the uh, the answer there. Similar for Brady. I get Brady, Dorsett, Gronk. I bring Amendola back. Bring Albert Wilson back. I'm sure there's some Kenny Stills, Jakeem Grant. Um, you just want to be on the right side of the game that goes crazy. And by putting yourself in a situation to get multiple guys like that, um, you put yourself in a chance to really push a line closer to the top. All of these lines are super unique, but you always want to sort of give yourself a look. So if I remove filter and just do, yeah, oh God, looking at Jordan Howard here and thinking that he was Trey Burton makes me feel like the dumbest person in the history of the world. Like, I, it doesn't seem like I'm getting uh, any tight ends in the flex, which makes me pretty happy. I don't see it as particularly valuable unless we are putting, you know, a Gronk or something along those lines there. But this is what I do. I do this for FanDuel. I do this for DraftKings. Um, it's labor intensive. Uh, I think that football is more labor intensive than any other sport that I play. Um... You know, I do a similar thing for baseball, but it's a little bit less important because you're naturally bringing stacks into it. And that's why the group section is so important. So guys, if you have any questions whatsoever on this, please feel free to leave those questions in the comments. I'd love a like and a subscribe for the channel. You can feel free to hit me up on Twitter. 
It's below my name or below my body right now at Josh Engelman. Surprise, surprise. Contact me via email, josh at awesomeo.com. A-W-E-S-E-M-O. You can see it up here. Oh, you can't see my mouse when I hover over that. A-W-E-S-E-M-O. It's all the way up there. Um, reach out. Um, I'm happy to talk this through. I'm going to be doing more and more videos going over sort of the things that I do in the process behind it all as we move forward. Um, and this is going to be something that we'll look into deeper with Adam and Lafi and who knows who else is going to pop up on process shows where we can do a little bit more of a look here. Um, the baseball season has been making it a little difficult. Uh, who knows? We could do an MMA process show and uh, get Osimo's, uh, Osimo.com's Homer Cleese. we have talked to him in Slack at all. We can get uh, NASCAR guys on here. We can do... We can get uh, Ben and Andrew to come on and we can talk process. But I want to do more of these. I hope everybody likes this. Again, if you have any questions, please put them in the comments. Um, happy to walk through anything. And again, this is more holistic. Uh, don't don't worry too much that I have like a crazy amount of any particular guy. All of this will change. Best of luck this weekend. I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, I'll talk to you guys again soon.